morning, all. The Jesus way. We've all we've all chose that this morning and and cho- cho- choose it each day in this um, beautiful spring weather. So we welcome everyone here and everyone that is will view the the uh, worship service later on on YouTube. And we're just glad that uh, we can join together and share. There's an ongoing amount of uh, announcements, and I hope you've had a chance to view them up um, on the uh, screen for a bit. Uh, I'll just briefly go ar- along with them. Today, of course, we have uh, an invitation to come to the Lord's table, and uh, those that do watch this on YouTube later, have your elements ready so that you can partake as they reach that moment in the uh, service. Uh, session for session uh, members tomorrow night, 7.30 here. Uh, Wednesday, our, I'll just say our last of the season, uh, coffee chat. Please join us if you haven't before, and uh, I, I'll, everyone's welcome. We're having um, speaker Eleanor uh, w- Brown, and uh, she has been here before. She's a very inspirational speaker. She is uh, light and uh, full of God's faith and joy. So we look forward to that and we're um, maybe ready for a little rest after we have our big tea and then we'll hopefully get back together in October and start all over again. I know Peg's already working on next season's coffee chat. Very, very busy with that. Uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday the 10th, um, there is the crafter's sale. Uh, from 10 till 2, and the mission project being the raw carrot, and Bill will speak to that at this moment, please. Thank you. Yes, we're hosting a craft sale here on Saturday. It's supposed to start around 10 o'clock, go till 2. I not don't do a lot of craft sales, so I don't know how close they are on the time, but the The church is going to do, we're going to have a presence at it. We're going to have a barbecue and for our community. And uh, this is all in support of the raw carrot. Um, It's a great project. They make great soup, but they also utilize underemployed people in the Paris area. And they will will be here with a a presence. Elaine, I believe, is, is coming. And so she'll be here just telling people what the raw carrot does. So yeah, we're gonna have a barbecue. We're gonna give it to the community. We're not charging or anything. If they, um, so we'll need a little bit of help. Uh, We're gonna have hot dogs, water, and juice, nothing fancy, but just, we need a little bit of help. A little help serving, a little help barbecuing, and just, if you're available, just to walk around and interact with the people. If they have questions about our church, it's, uh, a good opportunity to talk to people that normally will not be on our, our property or our community. So if you can help us out, that'd be great. Um, if you want any more questions after church, just try to find me. I'll try to be around. And, uh, but we hope to have a little bit of fun doing it. it, is, it's, don't be, it's, this isn't a task. This is a, very much of a positive thing that we can do for our community. So again, um, we'll probably... I'll try to be here around 8 o'clock or so on Saturday morning. We got a few shelters to put up, a few tables to put up for ourselves in the Rock Carrot. The craft people are responsible for their own stuff. One thing we are going to be close with is parking. And I know Rob and the board of managers have been working a little bit at that. So if there's any questions about that, I'm going to be parking off site because I know it's going to be a little bit hectic. So again, Saturday at 10. Thank you. And it's going to be a busy week here at at Knox. Uh, June 12th, which is the next Monday, a week from tomorrow, uh, we're starting the Alpha course. So I'm going to ask Lori to come forward. And I believe she has a video to show us about Alpha. As I uh, mentioned last week, 80% of people who come to Alpha have a personal invitation. Most people who come to church have had a personal invitation. Uh, We have printed off um, cards that you can use to invite uh, as as something hard copy 
that you can use as an invitation. And last night I sent out emails uh, inviting you to come and, and we would like to actually start hearing from people as to who are actually thinking of intend, attending and if they're bringing someone with them just so we can start getting numbers ready for the, our meal on the 12th. Um, in that email there is a link and you can copy that link and use that as a starting point to invite someone else. Maybe you would like to send someone an email and then follow up in person later in the week. Um, we are praying and know that God is leading all of us to invite and uh, open our hearts up, take a little bit of a risk. As I said in the email, no pressure for a big commitment. Come once, find out what it's about. That's what the link tells you. It, it helps you explain what Alpha is to someone else who doesn't know. Maybe you haven't done Alpha yet, come and find out on the 12th and then go from there. But I know a number of you have done Alpha and I'm really encouraging you to invite someone else. Probably, maybe someone unexpected, not someone that you were actually thinking that's who you were going to do. I'd also like to thank, uh, we've had a few more people sign up to provide a meal. Thank you very much. There's a, many more spaces and uh, anything that you can do to help support us would be great. Thank you. And finally, I know it's late in, uh, late later. It is in July 8th, uh, again, ICOM barbecue, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, and up on the screen, there was also the very, very good lunch from uh, Carl Luke. I have more um, information in hard copy if you'd like to uh, talk about tickets or uh, would like to, the number of, to call for tickets. So uh, I have that information today. Let's begin our worship. And if you would follow along with the call to worship, please. Faith is a gift from God, constantly renewed in word and sacrament and in the shared life of God's people. It is trust in God, involves personal repentance of sin, acceptance of Jesus Christ as Savior, and commitment to him as Lord. By faith, we receive the very life of God into our lives and joyfully discover that God knows, loves, and pardons us. God brings us to faith in many ways. We may have trusted in God from childhood, or our faith may have come later in life. Faith may come suddenly or only after a struggle to believe. Whatever your spiritual journey we have traveled, God honors our faith, great or small. Faith is a response to God's presence in the midst of life. It says yes to God who is here. Let's stand together to sing our first worship song, Heart of Worship. Let's come before him in prayer. Holy God, you are three in one and one in three. Praise to you, source of life, maker of heaven and earth, who create us, created us in your image and called us good. Praise to you, Jesus Christ, born in our flesh to teach us how to love and offer us grace and mercy. Praise to you, Holy Spirit, for the energy you bring us to greet each day as a gift. Holy God, three in one and one in three, we praise you for your mystery and mercy. Reveal to us how to live as your people and witness to your wonder and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue our singing as we have decided to follow Jesus. We are thankful for each day, and as we follow Jesus, we grow just a little bit more like him every day as we follow him. And as we follow him, we give thanks for each day that he gives to us. Let us, at this time, at offering time, and you've presented offerings in whatever way is 
you are able. Let us give thanks with prayer. Let us pray together. Today, as you call us to your table, we acknowledge this invitation as part of your outpouring of love. For your very nature is love. May our gifts offered be an outpouring of our love for you, Lord, and our willingness to put that love into action in your world. God of overflowing love, receive our gifts as signs of our love and commitment to live for you. Bless our gifts and our lives that may accomplish more than we can ask or even imagine as we follow Jesus. Equipped by the Spirit to serve you well and wisely. In his name, amen. Well, good morning. How's everyone? We're excellent. How's everyone? Because today's the day that the Lord has made, and he's done so much for us. And even though we carry different things and concerns, we know that our God is good. And that gives us hope every day, and that brings us joy, especially as we gather as God's people and worship together. So, how is everyone? Excellent, because God is good. We have an opportunity to just come before God and share all of those things that we have on our hearts this morning. And uh, we can certainly offer them uh, openly, but there will also be time this morning to give silent prayers as we pray together. Um, can we lift up anything in prayer of concern or expressions of joy and celebration? You like the cooler weather? Diane got too hot last week. <laughs> Successful travels. Alpha, we'll pray for. Let's come to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that because of your grace and mercy, your goodness and your faithfulness toward us, the peace and the grace that you pour over us, Lord, that we can respond and today say we are excellent. Because we know who we are in Christ. We know of the wonderful love of knowing our identity, of knowing our worth, of knowing our place and our purpose. We thank you, Good Shepherd, for providing all of this for us. We thank you for being our risen Savior. And we thank you, O oh Shepherd, for leading us, loving us, and giving up your life so that we might be restored to an intimate and everlasting relationship with God. Because you are our shepherd and protector, our defender, we desire to share with you some of our needs and our joys. So, Father, we pray that you would listen to the hearts as we silently share our most private and personal thoughts. Hear us this morning, O oh God, as we share about our work or our school. Hear us, Father, as we carry friends on our hearts, both their joys and their needs, we lift them to you. We lift up our family, whether nearby or distant. And we lift up before you our local community, our nation, and our world. Father, we thank you for weather that brings both warmth and coolness. We pray for rain. 
And we pray, O oh God, for the brokenness of this world in which the environment is groaning with the earth. And we pray, Father, that as we hear your call again this week to be stewards of your land, that we may be mindful of the way that we live, the things that we do, and the way that we care for your earth. We pray, Father, that you would bless us as we seek to discover more about your gospel and to learn from others and to share openly about what it means to follow Jesus as we begin Alpha. We pray, Father, that the invitation of your spirit may stir in people's hearts so that when we ask them, they might be ready to say yes. We pray, Father, that... You who have said the harvest is plentiful, we ask that you would bless us as we seek to be a part of your harvest and to extend that harvest. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us in the growth process of our spirituality and of our faith. Open our eyes that our hearts might burn with belief in your gospel. Increase our own appreciation of who you are and how you love all people, not just us or even those like us. Impress us that, like you, we can love those who are very different than ourselves, those whose skin is different, whose culture and value is different than ours, whose religious convictions are different than ours, and whose economic levels might be far below or far above ours. Because you love all, we ask help to love all. We pray then also for the victims of hunger, for victims of racial discrimination, for victims whose freedoms have been prohibited by political forces, for victims of injustice. We pray, Holy Father, that you would make us more sensitive to you and to one another. Bring us to both humility and boldness. Shepherd us, Lord Jesus, in our pilgrimage. Give us the courage to know just how broken we are. Give us courage to confess. Give us courage to receive your mercy and to be merciful. Grant us endurance to be faithful to those in our care. And it is in the name of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. This morning we're taking a break from the Beatitudes and focusing on uh, communion this morning. And so I invite, I believe, Peg to come and read our scripture from Luke 24. It's the story of the road to Emmaus, and people are talking about, did Jesus rise from the dead? And so Peg will share the word of God. seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces turned downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. 
And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this morning I'm doing things a little bit differently. When we were in England with our daughter Hannah and she had been studying at Sotheby's, of course, she became very smart about all things art. And she took us to the British Museum and said, Mom and Dad, I want to show you my most favorite piece of art. And it is The Supper at Emmaus by Caravaggio. There's a painting done in the Renaissance period, uh, later Renaissance, 1600s. And it is The Supper at Emmaus. And it has a lot to tell us. So this isn't going to be a sermon of its typical uh, sermonizing, uh, but rather Caravaggio himself is preaching to us. And I'm just um, using uh, Hannah's wisdom uh, to share some of that with you this morning. And so here we have in a painting the heart of the gospel in which there is also an invitation for you. We move to our next slide in which we see another painting, also the road to Emmaus or supper at Emmaus. This one painted by Titian, and you can see it is much, much different. And I'm not going to go into a lot of this, but he's painting also in the Renaissance period. And, and when people discuss this painting, they talk about form and paint structure and, or brushing and that kind of thing. You'll also see that um, all the characters are richly dressed. They're very orderly. And this is a painting that most Renaissance paintings, and particularly biblical ones, talked about idealism, idealized realism. In other words, if you were a follower of Jesus, this is what it should look like. Pious, well-dressed, very holy. Now, that's not to say that that's wrong, but this is an ideal that can sometimes feel a little bit cold. And so when we compare the two paintings, we see one that's in an idealism and another one, Caravaggio, which is much more relaxed and, and seems more inviting to us, the viewers. It's a stark contrast. And Caravaggio actually was ridiculed and mocked and people were shocked by his painting because they were forced to look at poverty. You'll see that one of the disciples has a rip, a tear in that elbow. It's just not ideal Christian behavior. The setting is rather haphazard as, as they're in this movement. They're paupers, actually. And what the painting says is that anybody can sit with the Lord. And it highlights that Christ himself desires a relationship with everyone, as you can see them all focused on Christ very closely, very intimately, where the other ones in Titian's is more in a line. And as a matter of fact, it's almost like Titian, if you, if you look at that painting carefully, looks a lot like Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. He's just trying to show maybe his art is just as good, if not better. It's a bit of a different show. So our question is, who is in this painting? We can see quite clearly that one is Jesus, uh, down at your lower left. He's simple. He's warm. He's approachable. He's not in all white. He's not looking holy with a halo on his head. He's very approachable. Then there's an unnamed disciple with a seashell on his chest. 
and we'll talk about that in a moment. Some people say that it's St. Peter. Some say it's probably, it's an unnamed disciple. Um, quite often, if, if you read scripture, when a person who is writing, they never identify themselves. So when John writes his gospel, he'll say, you know, there was Peter and James and the disciple that Jesus loved. He doesn't name himself. We have the same in Mark. There was another person at the Garden of Gethsemane who dropped his cloak and ran. More than likely, Mark. So there's some debate whether or not this is Luke. In other words, regardless of who it is, these are two disciples that are not apostles that Jesus is revealing himself to, which again broadens the invitation to get to know Jesus. The one with the torn sleeve is Cleopas. And then there's a fourth character that's not in the Bible story, and maybe even a fifth that we'll get to. Now, the fourth keeper being an innkeeper. He's just there to serve. He maybe hasn't heard the story. In the next scene, we see that Caravaggio shows the scene that maybe we might be there experiencing the action. It's, it's capturing a moment with all the activity. And this is the moment that we're capturing. From Luke 24, verse 30. When he was at the table with them, that's Jesus, he broke bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and then he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were our hearts not burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? You see, their hearts were burning the whole time they walked from Jerusalem to Emmaus and they met this stranger. It's a seven-mile walk. Now, whether or not Jesus walked the full seven miles, but it was long enough that Jesus unfolded his whole story, his whole redemptive story, that he would die and that he would be raised again for the salvation of all people. And in the story, it also says that they had been looking for the Messiah, and when they talked to, the G to, to Jesus on the road, not knowing it was Jesus, they said, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was the one whom we had hoped would bring deliverance. They're confused. They're lost. They've given everything to believe in Jesus, and now they're not sure because they just witnessed his death. But they're also not sure because they've heard that he's come back to life. And so they're wrestling with these things. And Jesus walks beside them and openly draws them into conversation and says, okay, let's wrestle with this together. He doesn't reveal himself right away. He lets them open up to him and share what they're struggling with. We know it's the moment that Jesus broke the bread, as we see in the next slide, because Jesus is blessing the bread with his hand raised, and his other hand is just about to reach out and break it. What's very interesting, of course, is Jesus is the stranger who's been invited in. And now all of a sudden he's turned into a servant host. He gives the blessing. And he's about to break the bread. And the blessing, if we know a little bit about the typical Jewish blessing before a meal, reveals a lot about Christ himself at this moment. Hear the blessing. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the world, who has caused bread to come forth out of the earth, it's a self-revelation that Jesus himself is the bread of life who is broken out of the earth and has risen from the dead. And so the moment that Caravaggio captures is, is like one second before they fully get it. But they're already saying, our hearts are burning within us because we recognize Jesus from doing this breaking of the bread and the blessing before. Their eyes are open, meaning that 
Jesus told them what to expect. And they're beginning to realize that the rumors of the resurrection are actually true. And that their Messiah is actually sitting before them. And so there's different stages of recognition and belief among them. Cleopas, notably in the chair, is actively ready to leap out. Can you imagine all of your hope revealed? And your Lord is sitting right across from you and you're ready to just give him your all. The other unnamed disciple in the text has his arms outstretched, almost as if connecting and embracing everything that his Lord is saying. And he's also somewhat reaching out to the innkeeper in the story. Now you'll note that his hands, it's a little bit dark in this picture, his hands are exactly the same size. And when you do a painting in perspective, the one in the back would be a little bit smaller. But Caravaggio makes them the same size. Not only is he showing the joy, the great, intense joy, but also a symbol of Christ himself having died. This disciple recognizes and is connecting through the painting, not the disciple himself, the cross. And as such, is reaching out to the risen Lord. So we have the symbol of the cross there through his arms. Then there's the third person, the innkeeper. And he's not as active. He's kind of standing back, and, and maybe he hasn't followed Jesus. Maybe he's never heard too much other than, oh, there's this preacher that goes around in Jerusalem and Galilee and here he is, he's serving, and he's, he's almost like saying, anybody want another glass of wine? You know, he's just kind of taking it in, wondering what is going on. He doesn't see the symbolism, and yet, because the disciple with the shell is somewhat both looking at Jesus, but also somewhat toward the innkeeper, it shows that he too is receiving the gospel message, that it's there for him as well. He's been invited into the story and he's witnessing a phenomenal change from the other disciples that makes his heart ready to hear what is going on here that you guys are leaping out of your chairs. Now we look at the next one and oh, it does work. At Car Luca, it didn't work, unfortunately. <laughs> so we're looking at Caravaggio's intentional painting, his composition of what he's doing here. Again, it's important to compare him to other Renaissance painters. They, they usually painted a triangle to highlight their focus, and Caravaggio does the same. But usually other Renaissance painters have different triangles. This triangle for that story, this triangle for that one. But you'll see that Caravaggio has triangles that draw everybody in toward Jesus. Jesus has two followers. But also, with his hand being raised in the blessing, it's a, I mean, honestly, for Renaissance, it's a symbol of the Pope who always prayed blessing in the same way. So there's a little bit of, I mean, this is uh, just shortly after Reformation. Although Caravaggio is a Protestant, so we, we need to know that as well. He's, he's, again, many of the, anyway, we won't get into that. I'm not going to get into that. But his, his finger also draws in the innkeeper right toward his eyesight, and you'll see the innkeeper also has this view of Jesus directly. He's intensely interested and what's happening here. And of course there you see that unnamed disciple is also reaching out to all of them. They're all being drawn in. And so again, when we look at the seashell, there's a lot of iconography in, in Renaissance period. There's all kinds of symbols for Christ, this, this being one of them. The shell was no different. It was a strong symbol of proclaiming that you love Christ and you are going to tell the world about it. And so even there, his hands are proclaiming the Christ. It's an invitation to come to the table, 
And it's an invitation that all are welcome. And so we move to domestic realism. This is where Caravaggio is moving towards. He's speaking through the painting, Christ came for everyone, not just the rich. And so a lot of Renaissance painters would have, who were famous, would have people come to them and go, I'll model for you. But they were rich, and they paid to be the models. Caravaggio went out into the streets and took anybody. Unnamed person said, would you like to sit for me and be in a painting? And so he drew from the common people because he wanted to make clear that the invitation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the free gift of salvation, was for all people. And so he painted them very much as they were and how they were dressed. He's getting real with his audience. Again, in the next painting, we, we get back to kind of the idealist realism. Caravaggio was portraying something radically different and was often criticized for making his figures too real. You don't, you don't want to see people with all of that emotion, or however people looked at it. He did so by depicting wholly biblical characters as working class people, despite the reality that the biblical characters were fishermen and carpenters and ordinary people. And so he's bringing back the reality of the gospel into the painting world. Well, let's have a look at the space on the table in front. There's room there. Who do you think that seat would be for? You. Caravaggio has left room at the table for you to pull up a chair. Your place is at the table and you too are being drawn in with a new triangle of that hand reaching out and says, come, sit at the table. But maybe you need to look at the painting. We'll look at the next slide. Before you can sit down, there's a problem. What do you see happening to the fruit? It's going to fall. It's right on the edge of the table. And if you were coming up to that table, what would you do with that bowl of fruit? You would grab it because it's about to fall. And when you grab it, you're going to give it to someone to set. You're going to give it to Jesus. Why? Because if we look closely at the fruit in the next picture, does that look appetizing to you? It's rotten fruit. And so Caravaggio is, is, is saying, you know, when you grab that fruit, you're embracing your own sin. The knowledge that you yourself would have eaten the forbidden fruit, the rotten fruit that caused the sin in the world and you're hanging on to it. But you don't need to hang on to it for long because you can hand it over to the crucified, risen Christ to take care of. Pretty phenomenal. Jesus invites you to come to the table. You can see in the basket, I mean, it's got a red line in there. But if you were to see that section all by itself, you would see that the weaving of the basket is actually in the shape of a fish. And that's another very strong Christian symbol. And without, oh, we'll, go, we'll stay back there just for a second. And you'll see the shadow, which makes no sense at all, just in case you missed it in the basket. Caravaggio wants you to make sure that you see the fish. Now, the fish, of course, was a very important symbol in Christianity, and now we can move to the next side. It was easily drawn. And during the time of Christian persecution, particularly 2nd and 3rd century, the fish kind of came in, the ixtis. And people would meet others, and they weren't sure if they could trust them as another Christian. 
And so what they would do is take a stick and draw on the ground the bottom half of the fish. And if the other person was a Christian, they could complete it by drawing the other half. And so they knew that they were Christians together and it was safe. All in all, between the shell, between the fish, these incredible symbols, they are declarations of faith that you can grab onto. This isn't your average dinner scene. This is the story of the gospel, which scripture itself invites all of us into to consider as to whether or not we will believe, as to whether or not we will own our rotten fruit and hand it over to Jesus and receive his, his grace. And whether or not we would wear the shell and proclaim, I'm a follower of Jesus. Or whether or not we would protect other Christians by drawing the fish. This painting invites you to consider, are you going to come to the table? And as we prepare for the table of our Lord, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the world who has caused bread to come forth out of the earth. And now Jesus invites you to take, eat, remember, and believe. Will you be one pulling up a chair? Amen. Please remain standing as we begin our journey toward the table. We confess with people around the world. We'll give a moment for the PowerPoint to come in. Let's say together with Christians around the world, the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, and he come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the remittance of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In remembrance of God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we take this bread of this cup and give you praise and thanksgiving as we together proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's come together uh, in prayer and end with our Lord's Prayer. Holy God, creator of heaven and earth, with joy we give you thanks and praise. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and wine that we and all who share in the feast may be one with Christ and he with us. Here we offer ourselves to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, in your mercy. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Fill us with the joy of eternal life that we may be your faithful people until we feast with you in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, forever and ever. And so accept our prayer and our praise as together we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. People of God, you are invited to the table. It is not a table that belongs to the church. It is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's made ready for those who love God and those who long to love him more. Come, you who have much faith and you who feel you have little faith. You who have tried to follow and perhaps failed. Come not because the church invites you, but because Jesus Christ invites you. He invites you to be known. He invites you to be fed here. He invites you to be one. Beloved in the Lord, hear and apply these words of the institution of the Holy Supper of Jesus Christ. That our Lord on the night that he was betrayed took bread and broke it and gave thanks to God for it, saying, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. This is a cup of a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take, eat, remember, and believe the body of Christ broken for a complete remission of all your sins. Take and drink. Remember and believe the blood of Christ shed for you as a complete remission of all of your sins. Father, we give you thanks and praise for the invitation to come to the table to remember and believe anew and afresh this day of the wonderful grace that you have given to us, the call to be one in your global church, and the call to share the good news and the freedom of Jesus Christ. Bless us, we pray, as we move forward into the world, shelter us from harm, Keep us safe to the praise and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's respond by singing, I will follow. Let's stand and sing. Many of those words coming from Ruth 1, her promise to Naomi to go and stay where she stays. Go out and may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Um.